The story of Hannah, Samuel's mother, is a story of a woman who demonstrated what it means to trust the Lord with her child in a way that goes beyond anything that we can imagine for the father as well as for the mother. It begins in a polygamous marriage that is, of course, a marriage where the happiness of the woman is a low priority. Yet Hannah's trust in her God and her beautiful song of praise is an example well worth considering on Mother's Day. Let's begin reading in verse 1, the first eight verses, as we begin our study. First, uh, first chapter, first verse of the book of 1 Samuel. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim, now, I practiced that name several times, so I want you to know, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, and, a- and Ephrathite. And he had two wives, the name of the one was Hannah, the name of the other Penina, and Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not, and why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? Now let's bow together for prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your word, for these stories that lift up godliness and faith. I pray that you would use Hannah's example to teach us how to trust you with our children, with our lives. I ask you to work through your word to accomplish your purpose in each of us. For your honor and glory in Jesus' name, amen. Now, to begin with, Hannah was in very serious conflict, as we could read. Um, But all of this conflict was in reality a preparation for her for the time that was to come to her. Now, a barren wife allowed a Levite to take on a, a second wife so that he could have children to carry on his family name. Apparently, it's not something that was commanded in the law, but was allowed. In this culture, there was a great value, a high value of a son to carry the family line. In our culture, it's nice, but it's not something that is a driving uh, yearning that we find in this culture here. Now, the command that the Lord had given where he did command for a man to take his brother's wife if he should die without children... Uh, found in Deuteronomy 25, speaks of the fact that God had to a certain extent orchestrated this desire for a family lineage to carry through. Now in verse 3, we see that Elkanah went up out of the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. That's where the tabernacle was set up. Elkanah was of the Levites, so he had responsibilities in the tabernacle and the worship of the nation as well as his own worship. Now, notice his integrity through all of this. While God does not um, condemn the polygamy, he does allow it. He doesn't condone it. He doesn't say that it's a good thing. But there are aspects of Elkanah's uh, life that indicates he was attempting to keep the law as he understood it. In verse 3, he went up yearly to worship and sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts. Um, and then in verse 4, when the time was that he offered, he gave to Penina, his wife that was not loved as much as Hannah, 
and to all of her son's portions, uh, as was customary in that culture. And unto Hannah he gave a, a worthy portion, or a double portion, because of the fact that she was his first love, apparently, and she was one that he uh, preferred over Penina. Well, any time there is a polygamous marriage, there is going to be problems, <laughs> uh, to put it mildly. Uh, and one of those problems occurred in the jealousy between them. Uh, Penina, because she had children, uh, looked at um, Hannah and was jealous of Elkanah's love for her, while Hannah looked at Penina with her children, and she was yearning to have children of her own. There's no indication here of jealousy on her part, but it was something that would eat at her. It was something that, that was a huge burden for her to bear. Elkanah's responsibilities um, were also occasions for him. Uh, he, he would be gone with his responsibilities, and Penina would launch all kinds of personal vendettas and attacks against Hannah and would provoke her, provoke her to tears, provoke her to a loss of appetite. So Hannah was, was grieving over this. She was so worked up that she, she was crying all the time while they were there in Shiloh, and she had no appetite. And then in verse 8, Elkanah, her husband, said, Hannah, what's going on here? Now, am I not better to thee than ten sons? Now, in this particular culture, you will notice there is no answer, uh, indicating that in her mind, Elkanah, you just don't get it. <laughs> Um, he didn't have a clue as to the depth of her despair. His love was actually divided between two women, though it states here it was greater for Hannah, but his words served to give a little comfort in her grief. Brethren, we need to understand in these stories from the Bible that God wrote down these details for us to understand he has a purpose for allowing her pain. God is more concerned with how we go through our situations than in what it is we're going through. Because in her pain, it brought her to focus on his will and his power for her life. It brought her to a desperation in her desire for a son. She'd, she'd prayed for a son before this, but now she prayed so that she could give a son to God. And God would indeed reward her for being faithful to her vow. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli, the priest, sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and, and she wept sore. And she vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Now, in her desperation, she came to this point, of this vow that was extremely unique. Now, we need to realize what she was saying here. She would give him unto the Lord permanently. She would impose upon him the Nazarite vow, which meant that she, he could not, for the rest of his life, while everyone else was drinking grape juice and wine, he couldn't touch it, he couldn't even eat grapes or raisins. Further, he could never touch anything dead, which meant that he, would, he could not touch any animals that were dead, which meant that he could not eat meat. He would be a vegetarian. And further, he had to allow his hair to grow long to identify with the shame of what he was doing, or the shame that came with the long hair on men. Uh, thus he was identifying with how he was giving his life in humbling himself before the Lord. Now, this is something that she was going to impose upon him with her vow. Now, this was her only son. And, I mean, if, if the Lord gave her a son up to this point, that would be the only child she'd have. And yet she was saying up front, 
that she was going to give him to the Lord. Now, as she looked at what, as we look at what she was saying, she recognized that if God gave her a son, then that would be his power, his blessing upon her. And she saw God's blessing as her responsibility to honor him. Now think, of, think about that for a moment. If God were to bless her with a son, she saw that as a responsibility to the Lord. As parents today, it is imperative that we understand that God's blessing of children is our responsibility to honor Him in it. Um, if He blesses us with children, are we willing to give them up to the Lord for His service? Uh, are we willing for them as they grow older are we willing to allow our children without any uh, nagging, without any grieving, to move away to go to school, to move away to go into missions, to move away to go into the military? Whatever God works in them, giving them that freedom to move and live as God directs them. Um, wisdom is certainly required, but it will teach us that when our children are young, we verbally speak to the Lord, giving them to the Lord to accomplish His purpose in them. I, I think the story of Hannah is a classic example of what this means. Now, it's not necessarily to send them away while they're young, but to raise them for the purpose of living for Him, serving Him, even if it means moving away. Now let's pick up the narrative in verse 12 where he says, And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli apparently was watching, and he marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. Now, <clears throat> Eli had a lot of experience with drunkenness because his sons were masters at it. Uh, and he jumped to a conclusion before getting at the facts, which is what judging really is. Judging is jumping to the conclusion with what is observed to begin with, while discernment will search out the facts first before coming to a conclusion. He was judging. Then in verse 15, she responds and clarifies what's going on here. And he said, Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. Now, as she made her defense before him, she was concerned that he would think so little of her as to think that she was drunken. She considered drunken women as daughters of Belial. That is a term that is used for those who were scoundrels of the day those of wickedness. Sodomites who, who murdered a concubine were referred to as sons of Belial. Uh, that's back in Judges 19. But her view of those that were given to drink was accepted by Eli. So there is a recognition that drunkenness was something that is contrary to the character of God, and it was related to those who were scoundrels. Now look at, at Eli's promise. He says, go in peace. As the high priest, he, can, he in connection with God, being in that connection, could give to her a promise, and he did so. When he says to her, the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. Now I want you to notice her response. All this time, for however long, years, she had been agonizing over not having a son. But look at how she responds to one statement that is made by the high priest. 
In verse 18, she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight, which is uh, an expression of thank you. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. She was actually expecting that promise to be fulfilled. Um, reminded of the, of the community that was uh, in the Midwest or in the central states in Kansas, where there was a congregation that uh, was uh, going to meet together for prayer for rain. Been in a drought for a number of weeks. Uh, the crops were drying up. They were facing severe losses. And so they decided to meet together for prayer. And they gathered together, and there was a good turnout. And as the pastor stood up, he said, Brethren, we have come here to pray for rain. And everybody nodded their head in agreement. He says, we have come here believing that God is going to answer that prayer. And everybody nodded their head in agreement. And he said, now, brethren, where are your umbrellas? <laughs> now, the fact remains, the, Hannah recognized the fact that God had worked through the high priest to give her a promise. And she believed it. So consequently, we recognize her dependence upon the equivalent of the promise of God himself. Now, in verse, verse 19, we see her faithfulness to this remarkable vow. Uh, I, every time I read this story, I, I am somewhat amazed and awed by her faithfulness to a vow that she had made years before. Look at, look at what he says. In verse 19, they rose up in the morning early, and they worshiped. Uh, before the Lord, and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about, after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son, called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow, and Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I'll not go up until the child be weaned, then I will bring him. Now, the, the point is that time did not dim her determination. Um, so we, we move down to verse 24. When she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and a flour, a bottle of wine, brought him into the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young, of course, under two years. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, now the Eli is the high priest. And she said, O my Lord, as my soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. Whether or not Eli remembered, the Lord does not record here, but that's how she introduces herself. And she says, for this child I prayed. And the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he, Samuel, worshipped the Lord there, as, of course, as he grew older. Now, something we need to understand. The word lent means to give as a gift, to completely turn over. Um... It's one thing to make such a vow in a time of desperation, but it is another altogether to keep it. I am amazed at stories of people that I hear who, because of a, a potential breakup in a relationship, they make all kind of vows to the Lord, and then, and then they get back together and they forget all about it, and they, they continue on in their way, uh, rejecting His will for their lives. It's one thing to make such a vow. It is entirely something else to keep it. After Samuel was weaned, she took him to Shiloh, and she left him with Eli. Now, I don't know what the emotional aspect of this was as far as what Scripture says, but I can't help but think there was an awful lot of tears. This was her only son. She had no idea whether or not God was going to give her any more children or not. But she was blessed by God with a son. She had promised she would give him to the Lord, 
and she did exactly that. She left him at about two years of age, somewhere in that area, um, and she walked away. Now, she was not hardened or, or cruel, but she was honoring the vow that she had made. She was literally giving him up to God. And here's something else in the equation. I don't know if she fully comprehended this, but we read in Scripture that Eli was not a good father to his own sons. So she was not trusting Eli with her son. She was trusting God to work in her son. Again, the imperative for mothers and fathers, for that matter, to be much in prayer for their children and to trust God as they raise their children, to trust God when they have to make hard decisions such as for discipline, to trust God when they have to follow through with things that they, they have promised, to trust God to enable them to be consistent in their lives, in their example, as well as in their instruction and discipline. Now, I, I don't know about you, but as I look at our own country and our culture and the days in which we live, it's a time in which we can be somewhat fearful for our children and grandchildren and what they're going to face in the years to come. But the fact remains we can trust God to sustain them and we can trust God to guide them and to be there for them. Now, the point is, here is such an amazing example of genuine faith as she trusted God to work in her son. Now, she would come back up. We're, we're going to follow through in a little bit and see how the Lord blessed, and blessed her because of this. But first, in the second chapter, we come to a wonderful song of praise as she left her only son with Eli. Look in verse 1 of chapter 2. Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none besides thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Now, since God recorded, since God inspired Samuel to write down Hannah's song of praise, then we recognize that she spoke under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, God was leading her as she was singing here. Uh, she prayed, and as she prayed, she spent ten verses here uh, giving um, her thoughts to the Lord. Now, first of all, in verse 1, when we see her horn is exalted. The word horn is a, a, a word that speaks of a symbol of strength and success. And she says that, that her strength is exalted. When she speaks of her, her mouth being enlarged, speaking of smiling in victory over her enemy, in this case, Penina. Her praise began, notice the end of it, end of verse 1, enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. Her praise began with the acknowledgement of God's salvation for her. And then she focused in verse 2, His holiness, and she found Him to be her rock in her distress. Now, there's none beside thee, none as holy as thee, neither is any rock like our God. Brethren, in the difficult times when we can learn to lean upon Him and find Him to be our rock, we, faith is looking ahead to Him, trusting Him to take care of us in those difficult times. And then on the other side of those difficult times, we can look back and we can truly recognize, yes, He is indeed my rock. So it was with Hannah. Verse 3. Talk no more so exceedingly proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. In this we see the folly of pride in the midst of her praise here. The folly of pride 
I'm sure she was thinking of Penina's insults, how she provoked her, but pride and arrogance is to be ignorant of the knowledge of God. Think of that for a moment. Show me anyone who is proud, anyone who is arrogant. They don't have a clue as to who God is. They think they get there by their own prowess, by, their own, by themselves, but God is the one that gave them their abilities and their opportunities. And yet, they are so arrogant and proud because they do not know who He is. God knows all, God weighs all, and we all will give an account to Him. Humility is seeing God as He truly is and seeing ourselves where we fit in, in His purpose and His program for our lives. Then in verse 4, the bows of the mighty men are broken. They that stumble are, are girded with strength. In other words, in verses 4 and 5, she is talking about the fact that all that we have is from Him. Note the progressions, how God is, breaks the bows of the mighty men, where their weapons are useless. But then those that stumble with weakness, they're staggering as it were, are strengthened by His hand. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, as it talks about those with plenty become slaves to get their sustenance. And then they that were hungry cease, they cease to be hungry because they were fed. The, they that it, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble showing contrast as she moves along, recognizing God's hand in all that is there. The fertile mothers are weakened, in Penina's case, by their pride, perhaps. Having children is a biological process, but godly motherhood is a spiritual process. Motherhood without godliness is a tragic waste. Because there's no greater influence to point a child to the Lord in his life, in his thinking, early on in his years. And there is no greater lack than the lack of godly example and instruction that every child needs if they're going to have any concept as to who God is in their lives. Then in verses 6 and 7, we see praise for God's sovereign control. He is in charge. In verse 6, the Lord killeth and maketh us alive. He brings down to the grave, he bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor, he maketh rich, he bringeth low, he lifteth up. The point is that God is in control. He gives grace to the humble, and he resists those that are proud. In verse 8, he raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. He is in charge. He is in control from poverty to princes of glory. Certainly that speaks of salvation as we recognize those without the Lord are indeed in poverty. Well, they can have all kinds of wealth in this life but not of any value for eternity. What paupers we were before we knew the Lord, and what honor will become ours in glory. The pillars of the earth is a referencing to the fact that He is in control of the universe. And then in verse 9, He'll keep the feet of His saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail, preservation of his own for his own purposes. In other words, victory is not in our own strength, or nor in our own wisdom. It is in the work of God. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall, shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Judgment, strength, and authority is all something that comes from the Lord. God views the adversaries of His children as His own adversaries. He'll take care of them in His way, in His time. They will certainly give an account to Him. The story of Hannah is the story of trusting God with all that we may face, even adversaries. He will judge the ends of the earth. Speaking of the end time, but also when He speaks of His King, the Anointed, at the end of verse 10, giving strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed, he is referencing his only son, who will come as Messiah, 
to rule for a thousand years and for all of eternity. Now, skip down if you would. First of all, in verse 11, Elkanah went to Ramah to his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. As a child, he learned to serve the Lord. Apparently, Eli got his act together as a father. And he began to teach him how to serve the Lord from the heart. We see, when, you, when we read further down, skip down to verse 18, But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. He ministered before the Lord as a child. That was his mindset. That's what he was doing. And then in verse 19, Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, The Lord give thee seed of this woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. And they went unto their own home. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Again, she only saw him once a year. Um, I can imagine that whenever she left him, it must have been an emotional experience every year. Um, now, bear in mind, in that day, they did not have a Greyhound bus line where she could just hop on a bus and go see him. It was a major pilgrimage to make this kind of a trip, so they only made it once a year as a whole family in order for Elkanah to fulfill his responsibilities as a Levite. Now, she accepted the fact that she would only see him once a year. There is no record of her whining about it, no record of her complaining about it. She accepted that. And every year, she brought him a new coat. Uh, as, he, as he grew older, she would, she would make it a little larger. And each time, she anticipated that particular need for him. And then God blessed her with five more children three sons and two daughters. And again, we see how God rewarded her faithfulness. I'm amazed at Hannah, that she would, she would follow through with her vow to give her only son at that time to the Lord. But what an example for us, how we as parents must learn to trust God to work in our children. Trust God to work in us and in our mate, whether the mate knows the Lord or not, but that God work in us so that we can minister to our children to teach them to serve the Lord, even as children. Now, I do not believe that the story of Hannah teaches us to give up our children for someone else to raise. But we do see a wonderful example of faith in motherhood. We do recognize that our children are from the Lord and are to be raised for the Lord. As they mature, the imperative of letting go for whatever God has for them is indeed a matter of faith. Whether God leaves them to go away to Bible college, to mission field, to the military, or to a vocation away from home, but to serve the Lord wherever they may be. I never will forget when I, as a young man, 19 years of age, left to go to Vietnam to a, to a, a war zone. As an infantry officer, um, directly involved in the military activities that, that were there. I can only imagine what my father and mother were going through as I was walking to the plane. I know how emotional it is for me to drop off my own kids to college. <laughs> can, I can only imagine what that meant to them and how difficult that must have been. But brethren, we can trust God to work regardless. Trusting God with our children will compel us to raise them to know Him, to raise them to honor Him with their lives, and then, as they mature, to trust Him so as not to hold them close, but to let them go to serve Him however He leads them. After all, in a very similar way, that is what He has done with us. He allows us to make our own choices, however stupid they may be sometimes, 
but he continues to work in us so that we can, of our own free will, eventually choose to serve him with our lives. I thank the Lord for this story. It teaches us so much about what it means to trust the Lord with something so personal as our own children. We can certainly trust him with every aspect of our lives as we can trust him with our children. Let's pray together. Dear Father, we thank you for what you've given us in this story. We thank you for how you have worked in each of us to bring us to yourself. And I pray for every mother here, as well as every father, that we would understand your concern for our children, your desire to use them for your own purpose. I pray that you would teach us how to raise them for thee. Teach us how we can live before them as a godly example and how we can point them to you as our Savior. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for your awesome goodness. We thank you for those godly mothers that have pointed us to yourself. I pray that every parent who is here would purpose to live in such a way that we will be an example and we will be diligent in our responsibilities to teach our children to love you with all of their hearts. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.